Hey there! Welcome back everyone. Did you have a good week? Did you spend the entire last week managing to watch my Oz video that I did last week? It's called the Shameless Plug. Well, I've got another what I think is a totally awesome video here for you today, and I don't know if you can hear it, but somebody out there is using a leaf blower, and that's the only time I have to film this intro. Hashtag YouTube life, I guess. Oh well, moving on. What I have for you today is what I termed the Christmas movie advent calendar, right? There are so many Christmas movies, and how do you get time to watch them all? Well, that is a tricky one, uh, but I went ahead and made a schedule out of all the Christmas movies I watch. Um, maybe you watch them too, maybe you watch others. I'm sure there will be a lot of disagreement on some of them. That's fine. Put them in the comments, etc. To each their own, but these are my suggestions for excellent holiday fare. The holiday in this case being Christmas. Day number one. I'm setting this one aside for various Disney cartoons. There are quite a few holiday ones. There's that cute little Chip and Dale one where they sneak into Mickey's tree and Pluto tries to get them. There's one that's a little controversial, the small one, the one about the boy leading his donkey into town to try and sell it, even though it's his best friend, he doesn't want to sell it. And um, he eventually does turn it over. It turns out to be the donkey that takes Mary and Joseph on their journey. Um, thing about this one is it, it does have a part uh, that could be considered racist toward Jews. So um, I, myself and my family, we skip this one. We're not big fans of it. Um, you might have nostalgia toward it. I don't know. Then we have the collections of Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas, and then they followed that one with Mickey's Twice Upon a Christmas. Uh, these are very cute stories. There's Mickey and Minnie's Gift of the Magi. There is one starring Goofy and Max, uh, which is, I always like seeing their family dynamic, where they're making out their letters to Santa and getting them to the North Pole and then waiting for Santa. And Max is at the age where he's beginning to doubt the existence of Santa. And his father's doing everything he can to try and keep the Christmas spirit and Santa spirit alive for Max. And oh gosh, it's so sweet. And then there's what pretty much has become inevitable, the Groundhog Day version with Huey, Dewey, and Louie wishing it was Christmas every day, and then it is, and they come to regret their choice and try to figure out how they can get out of the loop. Mickey's Twice Upon a Christmas I'm honestly not that familiar with because we haven't watched it as much. I do recall particularly the uh, skating competition. There is one with uh, Minnie and Daisy where they're going head to head in a local skating competition. Also very cute. This one is computer animation as opposed to the more traditional animation of the first. I myself prefer the first. Maybe that's one reason we've watched it as much, but honestly, I just don't recall learning about Twice Upon a Christmas until more recently. So, Day number two, the Santa Claus. Now, I like all three movies in the trilogy, and we do watch those. Um, that does typically take more than a day, but for purposes of this video, I am putting them together in one day. The Santa Claus is, of course, the uh, cute little story about the single dad who ends up becoming Santa and his kid who tries to kind of impart the spirit of Christmas. He learns the spirit of Christmas through the whole experience. But one thing I like about these is that it's got the same cast through the whole thing, and we kind of go through their evolution as an extended shared family, if you will. And the kid who plays, uh, what's his name, Max? in the movies is the same kid through all three movies. So we get to see him age and mature as an actor, and that's pretty cool. They did a new version um, on Netflix a couple years ago, and we tuned in and it turned out, we thought it was a movie, it turned out to be a show, and we hadn't really signed up for a show, you know. So we watched the first episode, was like, mm, okay, weren't too impressed. Uh, your mileage may vary. Day number three. Holiday Inn. This one is decently well known as far as Christmas movies go, but it's definitely not as widely known as White Christmas. Now here's the thing. I feel that both these movies have a lot to do with nostalgia, right? If you grew up watching, well, a lot of Christmas movies generally, 
but if you grew up watching these movies, then you feel more fondly towards them. I did not grow up watching White Christmas, and it's a cute enough movie, but for me, it's just a little too cheesy. Especially the bit at the end with it. it it's just, it's a little too staged. It's, it doesn't work for me. Holiday Inn, I did grow up watching, so. <laughs> I freely admit some nostalgia may be at work there. Holiday Inn is fun because it is a holiday and it's not just Christmas. And it does have a lot of great sequences, including uh, the introduction of, I believe it's the introduction of the Easter Parade song. Uh, there's Fred Astaire doing this fantastic dance with firecrackers, pseudo firecrackers, on stage. There are some similarities between this movie and White Christmas, and White Christmas could be considered as somewhat of a remake of it. Uh, both star Bing Crosby. But also, this is the movie that introduced the song White Christmas, and for that, it is definitely notable. And although the farmhouse in White Christmas is beautiful, the farmhouse in Holiday Inn, oh, it's just gorgeous. Maybe I just like black and white because the imagination goes a little longer that way, but it's just, oh, I always want it. I know it's a set. And they actually make that work at the end of the movie when the heroine goes to have her Hollywood career and they make a movie based on her experience at Holiday Inn and just kind of pull back a little so you can see the cameras. They make that work, but it just, I still always wanted to go there. It's beautiful. One caveat is that Holiday Inn, uh, the whole idea of Holiday Inn is that they're only open on major holidays in America, uh, which may have been a little different at the time than we have now, but still basically the same. One of them was Lincoln's birthday, and for that they do a blackface routine. It was 1941, I believe. We used to skip this when I was a kid. We would fast forward through it on our VCR, uh, but now I watch it, although painful as it may be, because I think it's important to confront the reality. Day number four, Home Alone. Well, I mean, really, is it even Christmas without Home Alone? <laughs> I remember when this came out. I went and saw it in the theater, and it's, you know, big hit then, big hit now. It's, uh, it holds up. Little kids still love the little kids sticking it to the burglars and all those horrible direct-to-video sequels. Um, although Home Alone 2 is, uh, pretty good, although it's basically the same movie. It's got the toy shop. That's darn cool, and the bird lady is so nice. Um, there are reasons why you may not want to watch it, but you know, mileage may vary. Uh, I'm going to say that a lot. <laughs> but the thing about Home Alone, um, and there's been a lot of discussion, especially since uh, us, us first generation, that's badly put, but uh, who watched it have grown up and started to dissect it. They go, oh, how could the parents even leave their kid behind? How could that happen? I actually thought they did a good job of showing how that could happen in the confusion and the mess and the crowd. They Obviously, they, and after all, they had the neighbor kid come over. They did the counting of heads. Everybody was in a flurry. There were different vans. I can actually see that happening, as ridiculous as it may seem, especially to people without kids. But what really gets me, watching it as a grown-up, is the mom moving heaven and earth to try to get back to her kid. Because it, that really, really gets me. In 1990, there was not the internet, um, especially as it is today. So that really wasn't an option. You have to keep that in mind. But just uh, what I watch it for is the part at the end where she walks in and sees him. And oh God, here I go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But no, uh, he runs into her arms and she holds him and... Okay, gonna need a minute. Let's move on to the next day. Day number five. Okay, full confession time. This is very awkward, but this was not originally my December 5th movie. I had this thing all edited and ready to upload when I realized, and this is the danger of making a list like this, is that you're under pressure to come up with the list and you might forget something obvious. I forgot something very obvious. For number five, I originally put Mickey's Christmas Carol. But for all intents and purposes, we can stick that with the Disney cartoons because I forgot to mention a Christmas story. Of all things, how could I, 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 I don't, I don't even know how I could, uh, I'm sure many people would agree with me that it deserves a spot on this list. It does seem to be 
a kind of love it or hate it movie. My entire family, uh, immediate family here is not much on it. My parents and I love it. My husband's extended family loves it. Um, but he's not a fan and neither are my kids for whatever reason. I, I really don't understand it. Um, I quite enjoy this. I think it's very charming, nostalgic, of course. I really love stories how where people are telling how they grew up and what happened to them and, you know, slice of life type of things. And this certainly is. There's one moment that perhaps didn't age so well. It's the part where Rolfie's in line to see Santa, that super long line, and he gets stuck behind the quote-unquote weird kid. The thing is that kid's wearing a helmet and goggles and they're very awkward and so they probably have some severe neurodivergent type of thing going on. I'm no expert. But I I had to explain to my kids that this was not nearly so well known a thing when I was a kid, let alone when Rolfie was a kid, and he would have just been like, Oh great, I'm stuck near the weird kid because that that's how most kids without neurodivergent tendencies saw themselves as just the normal kids, and the other kids would have been like, Well I'm just weird. I don't know what's up with me. And thankfully we know much more. Okay, that addressed. Uh, yes, I, I think there are many great moments. Um, you know, there's iconic moments, really. The moments that stick with you. Heck, I, my husband's extended family who I was talking about, they've got tattoos <laughs> regarding these iconic moments of the film. So many great lines. It's rewatchable, and it's the kind of thing that sticks with you. Although I must also point out that the Fragile joke was first made by Groucho Marx, so that kind of gets me whenever people quote it. And other than that, this is very deserving, I think, of being on the list. So just curse my ridiculous chipmunk mind that's just bouncing all over the place and sometimes doesn't see what's right in front of it. Day number six, the 1993 movie version of the New York City Ballet version of The Nutcracker. This one was notable at the time because it came out a few years after Home Alone and it had Macaulay Culkin in it. Now, for years, I thought that they had put him in there because he had become popular. Um, but no, he actually took ballet. I did not know that. Uh, he got cast in this one as the Nutcracker Prince, who actually, if you're familiar with the ballet, doesn't have a whole ton to do. But he does have a little dance sequence in the second act. And I was so proud of him. He looks so pleased with himself. He looks so happy when he finished it. Like, I did it! And I was like, oh, good for you. You did do it. Oh! This is a pretty basic version. Again, if you're a nutcracker nut, I guess, a devotee as I am, uh, this is a pretty basic version of the Nutcracker Ballet. We've got the family party at the beginning at which the little girl, and this one named Marie, sometimes it's Marie, sometimes it's Mary, often it's Clara, she gets given the Nutcracker. Then at night she gets taken on a magical journey through her dreams or whatever into a a magic land. So all the dancers are, of course, professional and really, really good. I want to single out Margaret Tracy as Marzipan. This is a little longer dance in the second act when you're going through candy after candy after candy or whatever, and you can get a little like, okay, you know, looking at your watch, especially if you're a kid, you can start wiggling in your seat, even in the, even at home on the couch. Um, but this is an exquisite dance. It is very difficult. She and the other dancers in it do a great job, and I very much recommend that part. Also, this version does have actual Mother Ginger. Not every version does, probably due to budget. Um, but that always makes my daughter happy. She's like, oh, it's got the big lady in it. It's got some big names at the time, like Damien Wetzel. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Um, but he was very popular and very good dancer at the time, even if as the Cavalier he doesn't have a lot to do. But the main difference with this one, and I'm given to understand it's standard with New York City Ballet, um, is that they have Drosselmeyer coming in, Uncle Drosselmeyer coming in to give the Nutcracker to his favorite niece, but he brings his nephew with him the little boy who later becomes the Nutcracker Prince. That is not a standard thing in Nutcracker ballets or tellings. Also, I will probably make a, um, a video on Nutcracker versions at some point, because like I say, I'm just, I, I love the Nutcracker, see it every year on stage. 
the thing that they did here, and I do not know if this is something they do in the stage version or if it's just in the movie version, they have an extended sequence with Marie coming down uh, to check on the Nutcracker, falling asleep on the couch. Then her mother comes down, checks on her, makes sure she's okay, puts a blanket over her, checks the curtains, etc. This part they put different music to. It is not music that's part of the Nutcracker ballet, and I usually fast forward through it because I'm like, there's no need for this to be here. Also, they have Kevin Klein uh, doing a narration. Now, it drives me nuts when they have a narration over a ballet, because the entire point is telling the story through dance. And it's a pretty easy story to understand. As far as I'm concerned, I could be wrong, but I, I don't think the narration is necessary. Other than that, this is a very charming version, and if you're a ballet fan, it works. Day number seven, that ever perennial popular Muppet Christmas movie... Of course, you all know what I'm talking about. It's a very merry Muppet Christmas movie. Okay, I'm sure most of you expected me to say Muppet Christmas Carol. Now, I will watch it again at some point and give it another chance, I promise. But that was another one I saw when it came out in the theaters, and I just, I was like, well, it was a movie. I just, there was nothing particularly super awesome about it. Uh, I, w I guess I was expecting it to be funnier or something. I don't, it, it just didn't work for me. But this one, this one, not as many people have seen. I believe it was a television movie in the early 2000s. And it's basically the Muppet retelling of It's a Wonderful Life. The Muppets are putting on a show, as they do, and uh, they have their payment to make to the bank so that they can keep their theater. It doesn't get there on time. Kermit becomes despondent and feels that it'd be better off if he was never born. And an angel up in heaven hears him and comes down to tries to convince him otherwise. As with many Muppet movies, there are, you know, well-known actors doing roles and cameos. The whole thing comes together very well, I feel. It's cute, it's funny, it's heartwarming. It has a beautiful song sung by Gonzo and Kermit called Everything Matters. Look it up. It always just gets me right here. So for me, it's got everything Christmassy. Also, speaking of cameos, Matthew Lillard as the director of their would-be Christmas art sequence. Oh, it's it's awesome. And of course, we have beloved Joan Cusack. I just, she's fantastic. We'll watch her in anything. Day number eight. Love Actually. Okay, this one can be considered controversial somewhat because there are parts that have not necessarily aged well. There are not necessarily great parts for women overall. A lot of them are just objects of affection. Oh boy. And there was that whole bit that I found out re fairly recently, actually, that there was originally going to be a gay couple, uh, but they cut that part out, and one of them was dying of cancer anyway. It's like, oh, come on. It's very early 2000s in many ways. So for me, the this one is kind of hit or miss, but the sequences that do hit still hit very well, so it's worth a watch. I feel the ones that do hit, I like uh, the parts with Hugh Grant as the Prime Minister. He's, you know, doing his endearing uh, early Hugh Grant career thing, and it works. Um, he makes the Prime Minister seem very human, which you don't really think about someone in authority just being a human being, and falling in love, and having a sister, and etc. Speaking of sisters, can we do without Emma Thompson? No, we cannot, not in anything. And this one, oh, she's luminous and heartbreaking. Some people have said in the... That's one thing about this movie is that you're not exactly sure how everybody is in relation to each other. I didn't quite understand how she knew Liam Neeson. Was she a neighbor? Just a friend? Some people have complained. I've seen that uh, she doesn't seem particularly caring uh, when she talks to him about his wife dying, and I don't think that's true. I think it might just be a British thing. Um, also, the fact that she might actually not know what to say, and that affects us all. I thought she did very well. And of course, there's the sequence near the end where she finds out that Alan, the dear departed Alan Rickman has been cheating on her 
Oof. Wow. What a scene. So short, so simple, so well done. There are some parts that are, that are kind of middling, like uh, Colin Firth, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't know her name. I'll find it and put it up on the screen. Eh, I think because I I love translation error jokes. I just, that never gets old for me. Um, but just the fact that she works for him and it's a rebound and then there's the whole joke, haha, about her sister being a little overweight. I, it doesn't, I don't know, hit or miss. There's Martin Freeman, and again, I don't, I'm gonna find out her name. Uh, the character's name is Judy, I know that. That one works because it, they're a very sweet couple. They seem like one of the most genuine couples in the movie, um, but of course it's what they do for a living is one of the reasons that I can't let my little kids watch the movie. <laughs> But also, I'm wondering, I know what stand-ins do on a movie set, but do they ever actually have them stripped down if necessary? Do they do that and go through the motions and whatnot? That seemed pushing it a little bit to me. So yeah, there, there are good parts like Bill... How do you pronounce his name? Nye? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's definite, definite right part. Gotta love the man. Then there are parts that have been... have turned squidgy. Like Andrew Lincoln and Kira Knightley, their whole bit, I, I feel like he manages to save it by showing that this guy is always very honest and well-meaning. But at the same time, he's kind of stalking his best friend's new wife, and it just, it's, it's kind of uncomfortable that way. And then, of course, there's our friend Colin, which this is very 90s slash early 2000s type of humor. Like, oh, this guy's just really bad with women. But then he finally gets some because he's just such an irrepressible guy. And and yeah, gotta love him. Well, no, no, I don't actually. And the fact that he goes to America and meets American girls and they're all over him. It just, I always felt like, are they trying to miss, make a point about American girls? Is this what they're doing? Is this really how we're seen? Oh my god. <laughs> like, basically gorgeous, but easy. It, oh dear, really? No, come on, really? No way. Really? <laughs> Day number nine. Scrooged. Okay, as far as takes on the Scrooge story goes, this one is kind of cuckoo banana pants, but it's also a lot of fun. It's it's Bill Murray all the way doing his Bill Murray thing. So if you're not big on Bill Murray, your mileage may vary. I may have mentioned that. Kind of on the same par. And one, another one that is not on this list, I will go ahead and get this out of the way, is Elf. I'm sorry. I can't get into Elf. It's cute. It's cute. It's, for me, it's watch it once and okay, I'm good. It's Will Ferrell being Will Ferrell for like, what, an hour and a half and two hours. I've seen that. <laughs> it's, it's what he does. I don't, I don't understand. The, this Bill Murray Scrooge I can get into. And again, maybe that's because I'm more familiar with it, grew up with it. Maybe that's it. But just, I like this one. Our, our whole family looks forward to it. It's got Alfre Woodard. Uh, she's just, she's fantastic in anything. It's got Karen Allen, which, you know, she was in a decent amount around the time, but then she kind of faded, so it's always good to see her in something besides Raiders. It's got Bobcat Goldthwait, sounding like Bobcat Goldthwait, can't get away from that, but not looking like him, which is very different. It's got Robert Mitchum. Of all people, showing up out of nowhere, it's got Carol Kane, who we just love her in anything. And of course, there's David Joe Hansen, a.k.a. Buster Point Dexter, the singer of Hot, 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 uh, which any of us who remember the 80s will probably remember that song. Day number 10, Miracle on 34th Street. I'm kind of spacing out the real classics here, uh, along with lesser known ones. Um, and that's the reason why this is decently high up on the list. I do mean the original, not the remake with Mara Wilson. I've never seen it, um, and it looks cute, but it just didn't seem necessary to remake this film. Even though it's older, this film holds up so well. Maureen O'Hara, John Payne, who was 
a uh, decently well-known actor of the day. He more headlined um, lesser movies. There were a few musicals, actually, with Betty Grable, um, but he's not so well-known today. Of course, our main focus here is on Edmund Gwen as Nick and on a young Natalie Wood. Their interactions especially are what make the movie, and, and her, her mother, and Santa Claus, they're the main focus of the movie. How they have to all kind of believe in each other, and how they get to that point. And along the way, we have the ever-hopeful idea that this can affect everyone. Even the heads of giant department stores, which used to be a very big business, but even people like that can get the spirit of Christmas, which to me is caring for each other. Day number 11, A Christmas Carol, the version with Patrick Stewart. This version, uh, again, was originally a TV movie on TNT, and it still bears the vestiges of it, but it is very well done. It's quite faithful to the book in many ways, and of course, Sir Patrick just, he does a fantastic job. And Richard E. Grant as Bob Cratchit. I love Richard E. Grant. I just, I love him. He is a fantastic actor. So it's a pretty faithful adaption, uh, but it's also really well done. It has the warmth and the heart. All the things that you want to see in a Christmas Carol movie. Day number 12. It happened on Fifth Avenue. This one is definitely lesser known. I saw it go by in one of my streaming services and was like, oh, I've never heard of that. I'll give it a chance. Okay. Well, I really liked it. It's very cute. It is long. It is a bit long of a movie. So that's that's a point not in its favor. It's like a lesser studio Capra film without Capra. Uh, but that's what it's wanting to be. In fact, interesting note, I found out when I was pulling pictures for this video that they did originally ask Frank Capra to direct, and he said no because he wanted to direct It's a Wonderful Life. So, Capra asked for a reason, I guess. It's kind of reminiscent a little bit of You Can't Take It With You, with the uh, rich guy wanting to buy up all the property, and the little guy struggling against him, and in the end, a good lesson is learned by all. This one has Victor Moore in it. He's one of the uh, more popular names, and just a sweetheart of a man by all accounts. It's just, he's very sweet in this, as the bum who takes up residence in the rich man's house when he's away for the winter. This is his, this is what he does. He moves into this house every winter and feels that he's the caretaker of the place. He meets another younger man who happens to have been railing against this uh, rich guy and takes him home, well, home as it were. Uh, while they're there, the uh, daughter of the rich man has run away from school. And she stops into the house to grab a few things before she decides what her next move is. They don't know her and think she's a burglar. And she thinks the whole thing is a good game and decides to play along. So pretty soon she's finding a job and living there, even though it's her house, she's kind of living there under the radar. More and more people end up moving in. Soldiers with families who can't get a place to live because they can't afford it. So there are some real things here. The soldiers decide to try and pool their money and buy an old barracks and convert it into housing. But then the rich man wants to buy that land too. So that's where the plot comes in. But mostly this does take place at Christmas time. There's a great Christmas sequence. And it's just, again, this, it wants to be a Capra film. It's a little overlong, but it's sweet. And I think it's, it's worth your time. Day number 13, The Nutcracker 1977 with Baryshnikov. Not only Baryshnikov, this has uh, Gelsey Kirkland, uh, another very popular ballerina at the time. Um, she, she was quite well known, uh, partly because she published an autobiography detailing many issues she was having, the poor girl. Um, but she was no doubt the epitome of of what we think of when we think of a ballerina. She was light as a feather. Just watch her. She looks like one of those ballerinas in the music box. This one diverts a little bit from the classic Nutcracker. 
If only because Gelsie Kirkland plays the little girl, which she's obviously not a little girl. <laughs> it's obvious that she and the Nutcracker have Prince have fallen in love, and so she doesn't want to leave at the end. And her uncle comes into the dream and persuades her that it's time to go. But again, I'm not going to get too heavily into the differences between the traditional Nutcracker, or what I prefer as the traditional Nutcracker, and the knot. That's more for another time. This one is very well done. Although again, one quibble, there is brown face in the party scene at one point. Ballet has been very slow uh, when it comes to this type of thing. They claim it's sticking to tradition. That's their excuse. Um, but that is the traditional way that this ballet was presented was with brown face. And in 1977 was a bit late to be getting letting go of that but again this is ballet we're talking about here just so you know it is in there um otherwise this is a very good version barishnikov was a masterful dancer in so many ways and like i say kirkland just she's a ballerina wow just to watch the two of them together this is important history that should be experienced day 14 Christmas Vacation. It's just funny. It's just funny. It, it is. It's got its sweet parts too, and there are some parts that are very real. Um, there are some parts that are not so real, but it all works. Um, it all just creates memorable moments. Heck, we had a neighbor up the road who... Um, Last, I don't know if they have it this year, but last year they put out their Winnebago and a mannequin in uh, an Eddie costume and with the hose and everything for anybody driving by to see. Another one my whole family looks forward to. Um, I don't know if you'd consider it for little, little kids. Might depend on your point of view. I, I feel that a lot of the jokes that might be a little more grown up would just go over little heads, but that's me. This movie is notable for uh, the great aunt and uncle. I can't remember their names, but William Hickey plays the, um, oh, <laughs> he's great in anything. The aunt is played by Mae Questel. If you don't know who that is, you should by the sound of her voice, because she was the original voice of Betty Boop before she started packing up her cats in Jell-O, I guess. Day number 15, Gremlins. If you're saying Gremlins is not a Christmas movie, yes, of course it is. It takes place at Christmas time. There's a big old Christmas tree. She's got a story about her dad coming down the chimney and there's her Christmas pathos. And it takes place at Christmas. It is a Christmas movie. The Gremlins are wearing little Christmas hats for crying out loud. <laughs> Maybe not one for the little littles. It could be a little much for them. I know I didn't watch it as a kid myself. But as an older kid slash grown up, heck yeah. Oh, it's, it's a fun one. And Gizmo is so cute. I don't think... I love Gremlins 2. I like it a little more than Gremlins 1. Um, I think he's cuter in that one. But still, oh, he's so sweet. Although I gotta ask, what was it about 80s movies and Asian mysticism? Like you go into Chinatown and you buy something and it's got magical powers and there's all this stuff behind it. Like, what? Really? <laughs> I don't know. It was really a thing then. I mean... Look at Last Emperor, Big Trouble in Little China. Yeah, really popular. Day number 16. Jingle All the Way. Okay, this one's more on the list in deference to my husband because it's one of his favorites. He is a big Arnold fan. But I think it's a cute enough movie. It's really goofy. It highlights how ridiculous our holiday shopping can get by taking it to quite the extreme. It's got Sinbad in it. I'm not going to complain, but also it's got Phil Hartman in it. That dear man. Oh, oh, he's missed. It's notable, I think, in that you can really sympathize with his wife because she points out that he's not there for his son. And it's an excellent point because that is really shown by the movie. And he does come to realize that at the end and decide that he's got to make up for his way. So that's something. Day number 17, The Family Stone. This one is, again, a little more grown up. The kids probably aren't going to sit still for it, if nothing else. But it's really good. I like this. I, I like all the family dynamic. Everybody's so well cast. Rachel McAdams, I love watching in anything. And this is a different role for her, especially coming off Mean Girls. She's like, she's still a mean girl in this one, but in quite a different way. Not the only thing I didn't get in this was when Luke Wilson 
tells Sarah Jessica Parker that um, if she's going to marry Dermot Mul Mulroney, she's marrying the wrong person, making the wrong choice, and just seems obvious to everyone. And I'm like, I, it's, it's not obvious to me. I think it was him. Dermot Mulroney, I could not quite get a handle on his character and what he was all about, at least until he starts talking to Claire Danes, who plays Sarah Jessica Parker's sister, and they make a connection and hit it off. Then you get him a little more. But until then, I, I wasn't really getting it. Also notable for having a deaf character and most of the cast learned sign language, which was pretty cool to see. But one of the main reasons I like this movie is that house with the snow falling around it, some big New England looking place. Ah, it's gorgeous. I personally can't get enough. Day number 18. Uh, not a movie. This is a YouTube video series. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the channel, The Warp Zone. They're fairly popular. And uh, they did a series of Christmas videos for five, six years straight. They have five that are part of the same series and then one that's a standalone. And this is part of our family tradition. We watch these every year. The little story that they tell with the first five videos and then the standalone, which is about a Christmas pageant that goes awry. They are very cute, very funny, a little violent. <laughs> so not for little, little kids, no. Maybe with anything like that, watch it first yourself to determine your comfortability with having a kid watch it. They're cute, they're funny, check them out. Day number 19, The Shop Around the Corner. Now, of course, The Shop Around the Corner was remade into the movie You've Got Mail. Also very cute, uh, but not one that really makes me feel Christmas quite so much as the original. Honestly, for a long time, I didn't even have the original on my Christmas movie docket, and I don't know why, because it takes place at Christmas time. They're in a shop that is dealing with people shopping for Christmas, so... I mean, of course, it's a Christmas movie, and then the people who work in the shop themselves might not have enough money to get things for Christmas, and there's blossoming love and all that stuff. Jimmy Stewart, Maureen Sullivan, not so well-known actress today, but decently popular at the time and a very good one. Another one that I didn't think necessarily needed a remake, although, again, credit where credit is due, the remake is very good, uh, but it still holds up. And it's got Frank Morgan in it, the Wizard of Oz, um, showing that he is a very good actor indeed. He did, He's a bit of a fumbling buffoon, as he often plays, but he's also a shrewd enough businessman who unfortunately is being cuckled by his wife. And when he finds out, he tries to do away with himself. But then at the end, he realizes that he has something to live for and people do care for him. So his character has some depth, and he essays that well. Day number 20. Meet Me in St. Louis. This one, again, is not a strict Christmas movie because it follows a family at the uh, beginning of the last century. It follows them throughout the year. However, it's one of those with an extended and notable Christmas sequence. The family is happy in St. Louis, but then the dad says, I've got this great job opportunity, so we're going to pack up and move. And although they're not too happy about it, they reluctantly agree. So Christmas is around the time when they're supposed to move, and they're trying to deal with their emotions. And that is when Judy Garland sings, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. And that is what the song is about. So it touches you twice as hard when you get the underlying plot to it. Also, Margaret O'Brien as her little sister does a great job. She is at turns annoying in the right way, in the right little sister way, and just so sweet. This one is beautifully shot. It has a good cast. Lucille Bremer, uh, who interestingly enough was being groomed as the next big star. And she headlined a few movies, but then she turned her back on Hollywood. And I just, I, I cannot imagine what guts that must have took. And I, good for her if that wasn't what she wanted. That must have taken a lot to say no to that. It also has Mary Astor as the mother, which is interesting because uh, about, what, six years before she was playing a femme fatale. And now all of a sudden here she is in mother roles, but that's Hollywood for you. 
She plays a very good matriarch indeed, and just the moment at the end where she looks around the house and realizes they're going to stay. Her face? Oh boy. Ah, here I go. Day number 21. The Family Man. Of course, this one is It's a Wonderful Life, kind of in reverse. Like if Mr. Potter went and had the small town life instead. Uh, small town is debatable, doesn't look that small. The house they live in is very nice indeed. Oh my gosh, and you're going, how do I afford that? But still, they make quite a good, strong case for the smaller life. For just focusing on the smaller things, taking care of your family, raising them. And, you know, I think there's points to be had for both perspectives. But, again, this is what the movie is focusing on, and it does it quite well. Nicolas Cage is the star, but really this is Taya Leone's movie. She is just the perfect, the perfect wife. And I don't mean in some 1950s June Cleaver type of way. She is the perfect life partner. And, I mean, I say that as a woman, like, you know, not somebody I would want to have as my life partner, but, you know, that's who I want to be. Day number 22, A Christmas Carol. Now, this is the 1951 version with Alistair Sim, a British version. This, uh, A Christmas Carol, there have been so many versions, and I think that your favorite tends to be the one you grew up with. This is the one I grew up with. <laughs> And I don't think anyone will deny that it is a very good Christmas carol. Indeed, Alistair Sim is just perfect as Scrooge. But the rest of the cast is good too. It's a well put together film. The only thing that bothers me about it is an extended sequence kind of in the middle uh, where he's viewing his past and he sees the part where he and Marley took over the business. This is an extended part that to my mind, doesn't really need to be there, and I usually skip it. Other than that, it is a great movie. It is especially for Sim's performance, though, um, especially because Scrooge is the focal point of the story and how everything hinges on that performance. And he does a masterful job of moving from the old curmudgeon into a man reborn. Day number 23. The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. The original 60s version. Okay. So, first off, full caveat, we normally watch this on Christmas Eve, but I had to put something on day 23. Second of all, well, have I mentioned your mileage may vary? There has been, okay, recently there was the Grinch, uh, the animated with Benedict Cumberbatch. I have seen that, and it's very cute. Um, it's just not in my rotation. However, they are showing that as a free Christmas movie locally, and I'm going to go down and see it. That's one of our traditions. So it's cute, and it's rewatchable in that sort of setting. There has, especially among millennials, because they were kids in the 90s, um, there has been a lot of nostalgia growing up for the Jim Carrey version. I saw it in the theater when it came out, and I guess I was a little bit old because I hated it. To me, that is a horror movie. Oh my god, it's so, ugh. It's, why would you? Why would you? Ah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is about the 60s version, but I just, I have to speak my piece. Um, especially when you're giving a song to Cindy Lou Who and you're giving him all this backstory, and it's just, it's, mm -hmm. It's not necessary, I don't think. And it diverts so much from the original story, especially any time they give the Grinch a backstory. He doesn't need one. He, he's bad. He learns to be good. That's it. And sometimes that's all you need. And that's, what the and that's what the cartoon does. Plus which, the cartoon was directed by Chuck Jones. There are a lot of great Chuck Jones moments. I love the songs. Not just the Thurl Ravenscroft, but also the Dahudores at the end. It gets me every time. How their love and Christmas spirit goes up like a star. How they open like a gate to let the Grinch in. It just, I love it all. And Max, Max, what a sweet little baby puppy. One more quick little mention before I wrap this up. Some of you may be wondering why I have not mentioned The Nightmare Before Christmas. Well, I'm not going to. That is n because I don't consider it a Christmas movie. However, I also don't consider it a Halloween movie. The Nightmare Before Christmas is equal parts Halloween and Christmas, 
which puts it smack dab in the middle, which means it sits comfortably right around American Thanksgiving. The Nightmare Before Christmas is a Thanksgiving movie. Day number 24, Christmas Eve. Our Christmas movie for today will be It's a Wonderful Life. I usually watch this during the day on Christmas Eve, um, before or after my kids have watched The Grinch, which, well, I watch too. But not everybody sits down for It's a Wonderful Life because it is a long movie. I didn't care so much for it when I was a kid because it was a long movie. As a grown-up, I appreciate it so much immensely more. It's got a wonderful message about appreciating what you have. Now, that said, I won't say it's a perfect film. You you can't really say that, especially with... <laughs> it cracks me up every time. With <clears throat> the fact that Mary has become a librarian. Like, that's the worst thing ever. Oh, why? Why cruel world? And I won't say that she made the wrong choice by becoming a wife and a mother and that, you know, volunteering and that's her life because that's what she wanted. And I think that you should in life get to do what you want as long as it's not you know harming you or other people you know and of course the focal point of the story is her husband who did want to go out and do stuff with his life and never got the chance i get that a lot of us get that because we all have dreams that we never got around to capitalizing on we have a lot of things that we wanted to do but never got the chance. So that still hits hard. It still hits home. And that's why there have been so many versions of this story throughout the years. But it is also important to look around you and realize what you've got and how precious it all is. Some of us have that more than others. Some of us are more fortunate than others. I think if you are fortunate in any way, if you've got air to breathe and you can breathe it, it's important to recognize that, at least. And this movie, still to this day, does such a great job of that. That is the Christmas spirit, is appreciating what you have and realizing that that is a gift. And for caring for other people, which is what George does through the entire movie. Bonus! You thought I forgot this one, didn't you? Or worse yet, you thought that I thought it wasn't a Christmas movie. You were wrong. Die Hard. Die Hard is a Christmas movie. It takes place at Christmas. There are Christmas references through the whole thing. And we get the greatest gift of all. Hans Gruber falling off the Nakatomi Plaza. And then it is Christmas. This is a Christmas movie. Okay, so here's our little Christmas Eve tradition. We go out uh, once it gets dark or starts getting dark. We drive around and see Christmas decorations. Then we pick up uh, some hot wings. We come home and we sit down and read. Well, we read after we eat the hot wings. But then after reading, the kids open one present and the youngest goes to bed. Then the rest of us sit down and watch Die Hard. Okay, so there you have it. Those were my choices. Like I say, probably not without some controversy and disagreement, but that is how these things go. So you can stick with them, you can plop in your own suggestions, whatever. I hope there are some new ones on there that I haven't discovered yet. That's always fun. And um, yeah, definitely put your choices in the comments and maybe there's something there that I haven't seen. So in any case, until next week, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. And I will see you next week. Bye!